I have a title this morning, Sermon, The Gift of Giving, The Gift of Giving. Please stand if you're able for the reading of the Word. I'm in Romans chapter 12, verse 4 through 16. Again, The Gift of Giving. Romans 12, 4 through 16. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. Everybody doesn't have the same function, do they? So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. And here's the scripture. And he who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Amen. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, spirit serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Please be seated. Amen. I was given something this, this week, and uh, this last week I, I, I stumbled across a, a little book in the box back there. You know, you go through all the books back there, I don't know if you have, but I, I found two, and I've, I've read one, and now I'm, I'm, I've read the other, end, but I want to go back to the second one, because the second one really spoke to me. Um, it's, a, it's a book by a guy named Brother Lawrence, and he's not the one who wrote it. I don't know if you've ever read Brother Lawrence. But you need to. If you go out and get that book, just you, look past the fact that he's a Catholic, okay? Just look past it. <laughs> Listen to what the guy said. Because he's a brother. And he's a Christian. And you know, his whole life, you know what he spent doing? Trying to do? To bring in the very presence of God. And you know how he did it? By loving. That was his one focus. And everything that he did and everything that he said, and all that he tried to do, you know what his main focus was? Think about this. Write this on your mirror at home. How can I love God today? And everything that I do, how can I love God today? Am I loving God in flipping the egg that I made for my wife this morning? What is it? Is it helping? Is it giving to someone else? Whatever you do, do so to love God. And I think that's the heart of the gift of giving. The gift of giving. What's it mean to give? What's it mean? What, what form of attitude should I have when I do so? And how do I do so? What should I give? Because too often when we think about giving, all we think about is what? Money. Money. That's not what this sermon's about. When, when shall I give? When shall I do so? Every opportunity. I must say first that within every aspect of the Lord's teaching, we must recognize first where it comes from. What? The ability to give. Better said, from whom it comes from. The Lord. And the best examples we have of giving is from God Himself. Would you agree with that? Yes. The best examples we have are the giving that the Son gives. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And the Holy Spirit, who also gives to us? We should also recognize there's a special form of giving, which is given by the Holy Spirit. That's what we just read in the Scripture. That some people have a gift of what? Giving. And he who has that gift should give what? Liberally. Liberally generously. Overflowing. Because that's exactly what God does for us. What a wonderful gift to have to be able to see needs. And to be able to meet them, and to do so out of love, out of mercy, out of being cheerful in it, and liberally, not holding back anything. In, in, the, in the Greek, giving is defined as to give. 
Oh, that's pretty simplistic, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, listen to the rest of it. To give something to someone. To bestow a gift. To grant or give to someone's request. To supply and furnish things that are necessary. To give over. To deliver. To give forth from one's self. And when I think about that last term, to give forth from oneself, it marries up so perfectly with God. Because in everything that God gives to us, you know where it comes from? From within Him. And I was talking with, you know, it, I think I mentioned this the last time I preached. It's like, you know, when a cook goes out and cooks something, and they, they take joy in putting something together for someone else. They're making it for their family. They're making something for someone else, right? And they genuinely love it. You know what, they, what, you know what else goes into that? A part of themselves, isn't it? And in every aspect, God does this for us. Because every aspect of anything that you have in life, the very breath that you breathe today, the very life that you have within yourself today is an absolute gift of God. Yeah. And you should ask yourself this question. How can I love God back for it today? How do I give it back? A part of Him has been invested in you. Amen? Amen. Regardless of where you're at in your life. God has given you a gift and you say, I don't have a gift. According to the whole, yes you do. You have the very gift of life in you. And sometimes I think the only time we ever want to marry up the, the scripture of gift is when we look through the gift of the Holy Spirit. But don't you realize the salvation you receive is a gift? And therefore, you know, salvation can promote itself after itself. Did you not know that? Does it have to be in preaching? No, maybe you just draw alongside somebody. Is that a sense of giving? Oh, absolutely, of yourself. You don't, you don't go out, you don't minister to the world. You're not doing all those things that we want to put such a high priority on. You know what you do? You simply go and you minister to some kid who has nothing. Or maybe, or maybe, you know, and not, not, to, not to pick on, on, on what we're going to do uh, in the next couple of weeks is you, you pack a bunch of boxes and you send them off to children you're never even going to see. You might not ever even meet them. And you think about the value of that? It may not, not, may not mean so much to you right now. But when that child opens up that box, regardless, and they see something that someone's put together for them, and they never ask for it. And maybe it's in a terrible time. Maybe they've gone through a hurricane. Maybe they've gone through an earthquake. Maybe something terrible's happened. Right? Maybe something terrible's happened, and they just need somebody to show them just a little bit of love. And you think that doesn't matter? It matters. The investment, do you think we deserve what, G what God gave to us, the greatest gift a man could ever receive? How much did he invest in that? Everything. everything. What? Everything. He gave everything. All, all, all that is of God. He invested in his son to send to you? We deserve that. You opened up that package, and I promise you this, you're still discovering what's in that package. I know I am. I'm still discovering what's in the package that God sent to me. He keeps on opening my heart and my mind to things in His Word. And I know that He's doing it to you. I pray He's doing it to you right now. Amen? I mean that with all my heart. I love that last one, to give forth from oneself. I love it so much. Why? Because it resonates with the very heart of God. Giving is a result and a product of who you genuinely are within. Who are you really inside? The act itself of giving is married to you. God sees every act of giving and knows why you have done so. He knows with what attitude you had when you did so. And with what intent you had when you gave. Or when you did whatever you did. He knows it all. There's nothing hidden from him. He sees it. So what form of giving is God pleased with? What does he like? Well, Paul gave us a good perspective in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8. Let's read it. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love. love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but not, do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all, listen, here it is. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act unbecomingly. 
It does not seek its own. It does not provoke. It does not take into account a wrong suffer. Ooh, there's a good one. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures what? Oh, all yes. things. Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Apart from what? Love. So even in my giving, then, what, what is the greatest form of giving that I can give? Out of what? Out of love. That's where it needs to resonate from. Out of love. Why do you think God sent Jesus to us? Because he loved it. Did he have some form of ulterior motive? No. I should hope so. Get you home in heaven. Amen? And that's, is there something wrong with that motive? No. no. Uh, but he, he understands where you're at. When you do your acts of giving, whatever shape, form, or manner that takes, God takes note of why you did it, what your attitude was when you did it, and what you did when you did it. <laughs> he knows it all, doesn't he? Giving must be done in love. The word is not man's love. It's not the form of love that you would associate with the world and what man wants to equate love with. It's the love of God. It is the form of love God would have for everyone. And to learn to love and ex exercise the very love that He has. God's love goes out to the other, regardless of status, listen, regardless of position, regardless of reciprocation. What does that mean, Chuck? Of what you're going to get back. Right. Right. That's what that means. From the other person. You simply do it because you what? You love them. You do it because of God's love. That's why you do it. God gives, and His giving is done in absolute love. And with the hope that the love that He sows in you as a result will become a welling up thing. Right, Bob? Yes. Because when I get a hold of God's love, what happens to me? It grows up inside me, and then I can't help it. i got to just start loving. <laughs> That's a good thing, you know? We grow in that. Are you, are you against growing? No. Look at, the, look at that board back there. When you think about heavenly food, I'm not talking about the food that you ate this morning. Right? I'm talking about the heavenly food. The food that endures, like that says up there, to eternal life. Because that's what we're studying about this morning. What's it do on that side? Let's see, that kind of food, uh, it nourishes. What? Yeah, yeah, listen, when Jesus was sitting there by the well, and he was feeding that woman the truth, because that's what he gave her, was the truth of God. And it, and it affected her. And she, it wasn't just that, oh yeah, i got a little bit of truth. She went on her way. That's not what happened. When Jesus gave her the truth that she needed in her life, and what she asked for, it affected her so much, she got so excited, she had to go tell everybody about it. And then his disciples came back. And you know where they had gone? To go get natural food. And... They saw him talking to her and had no clue. And then she, she must have left. And they encouraged him. They said, Rabbi, Rabbi, you need to eat. He goes, oh, i got food here to eat that you've got no clue about. Chuck's rough paraphrase. There's food here for me to eat that you do not know anything about. What did he just do? He just fed that woman the truth. Listen, the food of God, that kind of food, which Jesus, if you read the rest of that scripture, he says, do not work for food that perishes but rather for food that will endure to eternal life. That's the kind of food you need to be in pursuit of. This attitude of giving, right? What, what This food, listen, this food is so awesome that when you exercise that gift of God and you actually are able to give somebody something, no matter what it is, you know what it does? It nurses you. Wait, wait, wait. I'm nursing. Yeah, you're nursing them, but it nurses you. Oh, this is, this is really good food. This is the kind of food that nurses you. Not only that, but it, it, it keeps you alive. It keeps, listen, it keeps you alive. What, what, this act of giving, this act of doing what God wants me to do keeps me alive? Absolutely. Absolutely. Would you exercise this form of love towards God? And no matter what you do, no matter what you say, that form of food that is of heaven, like what? So we'll look at that list back there. When I exercise hope, when I exercise faith, when I exercise love, mercy, giving, when I do anything 
for the love of God and out of a love for God, I'm the one who gets nursed. You're the one who gets nursed through it. Because everything gives up its life in order for you to live. Jesus gave up his life so that you could what? Live. And yet, is he dead? Oh, please tell me loud. No. No. Is he dead? No. no. He's still alive? Yes. yes. So the form of life that God really wants for us is a life that lasts forever and then continues to give to others? Oh, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. That's what truth will do for you. Yeah. That's what truth will do for you. It will nourish you. It will keep you alive. It will absolutely cause you to grow. Just like you ate those carrots, or that roast beef, or the good deer that he's going to be eating here soon, right? <laughs> Sure. I don't get mad. It's okay. I'm not against any of you people who are, who are veggies only. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against that. I, I'm, that. Some people make their veggies and they're awesome. I love them. Right? I do. I, I love them. Like chowder soup? Yes, like chowder That's soup awesome. or whatever it happens to be. Or, or, or the, those, those camper packs. Oh, man, it's just good stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. But the, 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 the principle is this, is that God has given us everything that we need for a what? Life. Even the things that God gives to us causes us to live. It nourishes us. It, it pours itself into our bodies. And then what? It enables us to live. Think about it. Think about it. It enables us to live. To live and give. Yes. To live. God gives and is giving is done in love. So therefore, I should be just like him. My giving, when I give, should be done in, in love. And I have love. Jesus also taught us to give. Look at Matthew 6, 1 through 4. It says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Pretty, pretty flat out. Isn't it? If you're if you're doing your acts because you want what to be seen by men, you get nothing. Oh, you might get man's approval, but you get nothing from who? God. There's a reward that He wants to give you. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What's the attitude there? I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet. I'm just going to do what God has put in my heart to do, and I'm going to go do that. And if you get caught, <laughs> if you get caught, it's okay. Verse 4, so that your giving may, will be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will, will reward you. You keep coming back to this. We were talking about this this morning. I'm going to share this with you because it was just, it was really, it's really interesting to think about. In, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish style of life, especially with, in Jesus' day, and even today, what can you not do on the Sabbath? Work. You can't do any kind of work. Okay. So Jesus is walking through Solomon's colony. And this happens to be when? On the Sabbath. It's on the Sabbath. And... There's a guy who's a paralytic, can't walk, can't get up, can't do anything. And he's there, and you know what he's waiting for? He's waiting for the water to be stirred. Because he knows, man, if I get into the water after the water, everybody who gets into the water after the water is stirred by who? Angels. That they'll get healed. And the Lord comes up, and you know what he asks him? He says, you want to get better? Do you want to get better? And... Instead of the guy just giving him a yes or no answer, he goes, Oh, every time I, I try to get down in the water, somebody gets in ahead of me, and I can't make it when the water's stirred. And so Jesus says to him, What? Stand up, rise up, take up your mat, and go home. And heals him immediately on the spot. Now, this happened when? On the Sabbath. So the guy doesn't know who it was that did this. He doesn't know it was Jesus. And then Jesus comes up to him in the temple later on and says, Hey, don't keep on sinning, because if you keep on doing things wrong, something worse can happen to you. Other than being a paralytic, let that sink in. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like being a paralytic isn't bad enough. If I keep on doing things that are contrary to God, worse things can happen to me? I need to think about that. 
Yeah. So, but he finds out it's Jesus. So, guess what he does? He goes and tells the Jews. Now, the Jews have got a problem with this because he did this when? Uh, on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath. So, what's the point, Chuck? Um, I'm sorry, but who stirred the water on Sabbath? The angels. What? Wait, wait, wait. Now, angels are messengers from who? God. Ah! <laughs> what are you telling me that God's working on the Sabbath? You're telling me that God works on the what? He's the one who stirred the water. He's the one who sends the angels to send the gift of healing to this individual. And Jesus is just mirroring his Father. Especially when it's always about doing what? Yeah. Good. And right to somebody else. In your giving, does it matter when you do it? No. Whenever God puts it in your heart to do, then what? Do Go and do it. And when you do it, do it in secret if you can. But what happens when you get caught? Did Jesus get caught? Yeah. Yeah. He got caught healing this guy. Does he ever say, no, I didn't do that? No. Huh? No. Does, it, no. does, he, does he ever kind of say, well, you know, it's just, does he ever skirt it? Does he ever not acknowledge the fact that he's the one who did You know, they never really talked to him about it. This is what blows me away about these guys in the body. <laughs> they, it's not a matter of the guy was absolutely healed of being a paralytic and able to say, how'd you do that, Lord? But they don't ever ask that question. They're always <laughs> trying to stone him and kill him because he did it. I don't understand that. I don't comprehend that. Do you know somebody who needs a touch from the Lord? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what the reaction would be is if they were immediately healed if you knew someone? I think about Brian right now. I think about Brian right now, who's laying, still in a wheelchair, is he not? Yeah. Having a little bit of motion in his hands, in his feet a little bit, but still not completely what? If the Lord was to reach in and heal him immediately, how many people would know? And how would it affect you as an individual going, wow? Yeah. Amen. Oh, Lord, grant it to him. I want it for him, do you not? I do. Yeah. I do. We want it for him, don't we? Yes. Yeah. So why does the Lord keep us in those states? Lord, to learn. To learn. We were having this conversation the other night. We were having this conversation the other night. You know, sometimes you go through things like that. Not for them, but for you as an individual. To bring you to a point where you're in full reliance upon who? God. Where you are. Full reliance upon Him. Does it bring them to that point? I pray so. Absolute full reliance upon Him. Absolute. The gift of healing. Genuine healing. Chuck. Yes. Here's an example. Here's Lori over here, quiet, meek, and mild. And somebody comes to her and asks her to talk. And the Lord says, pray on him. And praise the Lord, she did just what the Lord said. So you can never go wrong with doing what the Lord said. No. So as we listen and we do. So that's just an example of how we live in the community and how the Lord can use us. And I'm thankful that, that you did what you did. And that's just an example, whether it would be Sunday or whenever, the Lord laid that on your heart to do that. But it's the, it's the attitude of your heart when you do so. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think the Lord would ever give you a word when your heart wasn't right to give to someone else. You're obviously in that spot, in that moment of time where the Lord speaks to you. Now, what happens when He gives you a gift like that and you don't do anything with it? It's a lot. We were talking about this on Thursday night, weren't we? About what people do with the gift that God gives to them. You know what they tend to do? Sometimes they tend to bury it. They hide it. They fail to use it. They fail to do it. It's like the guy who gets a gift from the Lord. Remember the, remember the talent story? Right? The Lord gave the guy what? Oh, he didn't give just one guy. He gave each one of them a, a talent. And they went out and put those talents to work. Oh, you, you got to use them? Oh, yeah, you got to use them. And they went out and he started using them. One guy said, man, this talent's earned what? Ten more, Lord. He said, oh, come. Enjoy your master's joy. Look, God gets happy when... The things that he's given to you, the talents that he's given to you as an individual, that you use them and they make more talents. Think about that. Even if it's only five, even if it's only three, even if it's only two. But don't be the guy who gets the one that wraps it up in a blanket and goes buries it and does nothing with it. And then you simply give that talent back to the Lord. 
That's not what he's looking for. He gives you the gift of giving so that you can give. Whatever it may be. Is it your money? Yeah, maybe. Is it clothing? Yep, could be. Place to live? Yep. How about a word of knowledge? How about the ability to teach? Yep. How about, how about the ability to simply encourage someone? Yep. Administration? How about acts of service where nobody ever gives you any praise at all for what you do? You just simply do it because you love God. Does he see that? Yes. Yes, he does. He sees it all. So our giving has to be done as best we can in secret. Again, is the attitude of heart which asks this. Why are you giving? Why are you doing this? And I would say this. It should be absolutely out of a love for God and others. There's nothing wrong with that. The love of God. Look, there's two, the two greatest commandments. What are they? Love God first and love your neighbor as yourself. So love the Lord thy God. So as I'm loving God with everything I am, then I'm able to, it enables me to love others. Just like He loved you. Is it to be seen by man? Is that why you're doing your gifts? No. no. Is it so you can be recognized? No. Is it under compulsion? Because someone has made you feel guilty, I do not want to be that to you today. That is not the intent of this sermon. It is not to bring compulsion on you to say, oh, I just, you know. No. God loves a cheerful giver, doesn't he? Yes. It needs to be out of the heart and the love of God and the love for God. That's why you should be giving. No other reason. There's no other reason. Giving out of these reasons is not the heart of, that God would want in you. It is not out of genuine love when you begin to do things to be recognized by men under compulsion because you have to or with an attitude of, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to give it. Is that really what God wants? The answer is no. Listen to this. Jesus gave all the time and in every possible way. He often tried to give in secret, but people discovered it. And he had done so because of what? What? The one who received it. I'll say that again. But people discovered he had done so because of what the one who received it did. Right. That's how they figured it out. The guy who got healed in the colony, what did he go and do? <laughs> Jesus didn't tell him to go tell everybody. He told, and he didn't tell him to do that. But he went and did it anyway. Yeah. And then everybody found out about it. It's just, that's a good thing. <laughs> the message went forth, right? Look at Mark 1, 40 through 45. Mark 1, 40 through 45. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, and saying, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing. Be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he sternly warned him and immediately sent him away. And he said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone. But go, show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely. <laughs> Sometimes I think the Lord has a sense of humor. I'm always worried about that. Why? Because Jesus said, don't do it. I and know he it. did it. And, and it's I, like disobedience. He it's almost like <laughs> he just couldn't do that. Know. I, that's why I said sometimes I feel like yeah, the Lord has a sense of humor. Yeah. I, mean, said, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, let, let's go back to Brian since it's someone that we know right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. Let's go back to Brian. Imagine Brian getting absolutely healed and jumping up out of that wheelchair and running around the streets and not telling anybody anything. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine that? Does that, that, is, that even fathom in your mind? No. no. Not at all. Why? Because he would, be, he would just be dancing and praising God all the time, right? Yes. How do you keep somebody like that down? No. Don't. No. Don't even try. Jesus couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't go anywhere. Everybody knew him. And they were always seeking. Does he ever turn somebody away? No. You never see it. He may confront them in themselves, and they may turn away from him. But he never drives anybody away. Like the rich ruler. Remember that guy? He comes up to the Lord. He's a rich, rich young ruler. And he, he said, well, Lord, what, what must I do? And he tells him, he said, go sell everything and then come follow me. The opportunity to be a disciple of Jesus Christ personally. And you know what he says? No. No, thank you. Because his heart was filled with his stuff. Back to the scripture. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the news around to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city. 
but stayed out in unpopulated areas. And they were coming to him from I wonder what secret giving Jesus has given to you. Let that sink in for a moment. What has Jesus done for you secretly that no one else knows about? Maybe it's forgiveness that you needed for something you did a long time ago. I'm sorry. Did you think we were only discussing money? No. What kind of giving is that? Can you heal someone from the inside out? Huh? What kind of giving is that? When the Lord forgives you of things you've done so terribly against others. True love. Oh no. Giving is much deeper than your, your money and your cash. The Lord has given you things much greater than money. Things which can enter the heart of another and bring a form of healing no one else can see. I know He has healed you. Healing is a gift also to be given. Giving should be done in light of what you have been given and what has been given to you. I'll say that again. Giving should be done in light of what you have and what has been given to you. Comes back to that forgiveness thing again, right? How can, how can I forgive? How can I ask for forgiveness from the Lord and then not give it? How does this work out? It's not the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed to give in light of what's been given to me. So if I'm forgiven, then I should give what? Forgiveness. And if I've been given hope, then I should give for it. And if I am given mercy, and I'm given love, and I'm given all those things that are so wonderful in the kingdom that we talk about all the time, the actual food of heaven, then what should I be about? Giving forth the same. 2 Corinthians 9, 5-15. Paul speaking. So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now most people take this scripture out of context and are always talking about it again, what? Money. Money. But doesn't it work with love? And doesn't it work with hope? And doesn't it work with the genuine things of the kingdom of heaven? And the answer to this question is absolutely yes, 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 and yes. Everything that God has given to you is an absolute gift. Want to see how? Well, let's continue on with Scripture. Verse 7. Each one must do just as he is purposed in his heart. Not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace. Wait. Uh, money? No, all, all grace. Oh, that's right. All grace abound to you, so that as always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Everything that we do is a good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad and gave to the poor his righteousness. His, his what? His righteousness endures forever. Do you realize that everything that you are so lucky to have as a Christian, the salvation, the forgiveness, the mercy, all that, you know where it all comes from, right? Out of God's righteousness. And in His righteousness, He spread that to you. In order for it to take its form inside of you, to become a part of you, so that it will go forth, including your cash. Verse 10. Now He who supplies seed for the sower... And bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase your harvest of your righteousness. What am I supposed to be harvesting then? Righteousness. righteousness huh? Not stuff. Righteousness. Right? Oh, better stuff. Yeah, the things of the kingdom of heaven. Verse 11. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. So in everything that you do, in all the giving that you do, what does it do? It brings those other individuals that you're helping to thank who? God. Not you. To thank God. Verse 12. For the ministry of this service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgiving to God. So what Paul is saying is that, yeah, they've been supplying his needs so that he can go out and minister, but when the ministry actually happens, 
and real lives are changed, they don't thank Paul. You know who they thank? They worship God. As a result of what? Receiving his righteousness, his salvation, the forgiveness of sins, all of those things. Verse 13. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience through your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all. While they also by what? Amen. Prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God for His, listen, for His indescribable gift. Yeah. Given should be done cheerfully. You listen to the account of Epaphroditus from the church of Philippi. Listen to this. Because that's what Paul was talking about. Listen to this. Philippians 4, 10 through 20. But I rejoice the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. And you, you were concerned before, but you lacked what? Opportunity. opportunity. Oh, then what should you be looking for, church? Opportunity. There's opportunities going to come your way. Verse 11. Not that I speak for more. For I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in, no matter what it is. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel... After I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent to give more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from who? Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus, what you have sent, a fragrant aroma an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So don't miss this, church, because Epaphroditus was the one who volunteered to take the gift and bring it to Paul that was coming from the Philippian church. Verse 19, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in what? Glory. What is God's glory? What are the riches in His glory? Like what, James? Give me just one. Love and awe. Oh, the best one you can pick. Love is a product of God's glory. If you can magnify it a billion by a billion times, you just begin to scratch the surface of God's love. And you can't help but realize that it radiates in glory around him. And guess what? He wants that for everyone. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Oh, that's not enough. Hold on. Philippians 2, 19-30. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will generally be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests and not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth, that he served me with the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving with his father. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself will also be coming shortly. But I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. My brother and fellow worker and soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need, because he was longing for you all. And was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick to the point of death. Now what did Epaphroditus give? Simply the messenger to take a gift from the Philippians to Paul. But he did so almost at the cost of his what? Life, life. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him but also on me. So that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for what? For the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient, what was deficient in your service to him. Wow.
that doesn't resonate with you, I don't know what can this morning. You see what he did out of his love for God and for others? Simply to deliver something else that someone had put together. But they need someone to take it. And Epaphroditus says, I'll do it. At the risk of his own life, just to deliver it. The cost was great. Wasn't it? Not to him. He saw it as an opportunity to love. Listen, he saw it as an opportunity to love God. What should you write on your mirror this way? How can I love God? How can I do it this week? Listen to Jesus' evaluation of giving. Luke 21, 1 through 4. And he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw a poor widow putting in two small copper coins. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all of them. But they, all out of their surplus, put in their offering. But she, out of her what? All the poverty put in all she had to live. That's the form of giving that Jesus is looking for. Because you're giving everything that you can. You're all in. Amen? Out of what? Out of your heart and out of your love. For who? For God. Not to be recognized by men. But simply to do what God is putting your heart to do. The ultimate giving is seen in the sacrifice of self to another. Jesus is the epitome of that statement. For he gave his life up for the sins of everyone in the world. Greater love has no one than this, John 15, 13 says. Then what? Then one lay down his life for his sins. Sometimes you lay down your life for others. The gift of giving is an overflow of love. It's an overflow of mercy and compassion in your hearts as you seek to help another, regardless of the cost to you. Regard, I'll say that again. Regardless of the cost to you. What should I give? Whatever God puts into your heart to give, that's what you should give. Time? Yes. A word? Uh -huh. Healing? Absolute. Help? Clothing? Food? Shelter? Mercy? Forgiveness? Love? Comfort? Yes, sorry. Sometimes even your money. May it always flow out of love, though. The love of God in you. Love God. You get anything else out of the sermon today, love God. Love him. And find ways to love Him. The opportunity to serve someone on the street, say to yourself, here's a great thought. How can I love God today? Or when you see an opportunity, say, here's an opportunity to love I have an opportunity to love God. I have an opportunity to love God right now. To do what? Whatever God puts in my heart to do. Do that, amen? You can't go wrong with that. Alright? Any thoughts, any other scripture? Do you think the widow went hungry? No. I don't think so. But I don't know. It doesn't really tell us, does it? No. Yeah. We have faith in God, and we know that in what we do with Him and for Him, and He takes care of us. So I, deep down in my heart, know that He... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You, you, you think about you know those who are who are who are concerned about uh, let's just say it, money and finances and stuff like that. And, and there was a certain guy he, he, in, in Jesus' own midst that what was all worried about the what money. money. Yeah. Remember the woman who had the the alabaster jar of special perfume and what did she do with it? She poured all her, and, and what did he say? Oh, what a waste! What a waste! We could have sold this and fed the poor. We could have... Jesus said what? Leave her alone. What she does, she does for me to want me for my burial. You sure that? Just went right over his head. Huh? Sometimes, look, sometimes the, what you do, you can't look at it as exponential pluses and minus a sign. You can't look at it that way. If we, aren't you glad that God didn't do that with you? Huh? He, did he look at you and look at the pluses and minus and say, nah, Jesus is just a little too much to give to you. <laughs> did he do that? No. Look, when you get, when you, do you get anything different than I do when you come to salvation? No. You don't. You get the same salvation, the same love, the same hope. How does it exercise itself within you? Each of us uniquely as it tailors itself to ourselves, right? right? But in every situation, some people are just really good at other things. They call those talents. And when you use your talents, right? They grow. 
The more you exercise in your talents, the what, whatever God has given to you as an individual, it grows. And it magnifies itself. And it gets really easy for you to do. Why? It's just a natural over listen, it's just a natural overflow of who you are. Is it really tough for Jesus to heal someone? No. Why? Because healing and recreation is just like this for him. He doesn't have a problem with it. Giving should just be a natural overflow of who what? Who you are. In many, many different ways. What a waste of life for suicide bombers. They do it out of hate instead of love. And, and what, what do they do? Do they, do, they, do they not realize the destruction that they're doing? Huh? Uh, this morning we read about a, a guy. I don't know if you did. You read about this, this uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't even think of his name right now. But he was one of the top guys in ISIS that they took yeah. out yesterday or today or whatever it was. Yeah. And at the end, yeah. he grabbed three of his own children. Three of his own children. And he had, he had, a, he had a, vest, a, a bomb vest on himself. And as they were hunting him down, he exploded that thing and took out his children. Did him I, I, and, and to think that somehow or another this is bringing about <coughs> God's kingdom? Where is the disconnect, people? And, 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 and I'll say this. Is there any celebration in losing a soul? No. Not really. That guy did a lot of damage. This is the guy who took that one pilot and put him in a cage and then set a fire underneath of him as the crowds were cheering around him as they watched him burn to death. This is the, the mentality that's there. Is that what we're supposed to be about? No. Should we even celebrate over the loss of a soul? The answer is absolutely not. No. There's somebody that, imagine if the Lord had got a hold of that guy. He's going, he's going to get a hold of him. Oh, he's, he's, <laughs> he's going to get a hold of him. We, we, you know, the, the, there's humor in that, but there's no, there's no joy in a soul going before God and not knowing Jesus Christ. No, sure it's really hard. As I'm sitting here, I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking. Um, I think it was in 2008. I came back from Libby, Montana. My home in Prairie was in the snow. I needed a job. I came home under really adverse circumstances. <coughs> Uh, the dog and the cat and I stayed in the Walmart parking lot in Lewiston, Montana, um, overnight. Um, it was a really difficult time for me. I knew I could not return to Prairie because I needed a job and I needed to be where I could afford to travel and I couldn't travel from Prairie every day and get a job. In the meantime, I had a friend, an elderly friend, who was having a really difficult time. And she lived in Mountain Home, and so I went to find her. Well, it turned out that she had moved, had a difficult situation with her daughter. I, um, and I went to church at a church in Mountain Home. Um, that morning and I was just distraught because I didn't know where to find Levon. I was really concerned about her because there were some real strange things going on. And so I went to this church and I was weeping <laughs> and very quietly and when I came out there was a couple and they said, we noticed that you're crying, can we help in some way? And so I very briefly explained to them the circumstance that I was in. Um, and they, in their love of God, took me into their home from February to the end of March at spring break at church and let me live there and hunt for a job. And I spent the night with, I spent I had my little dog with me, too, and that was a burden, I'm sure, on them. 
So I'm sitting here thinking of them and really wishing blessings on them. I don't know where they are right now, but that's my story. God. Talk about love. Oh, they didn't know me from anybody. You know, I could have been a crazy person or who knows what else. Yeah. But they trusted and yeah. it was just wonderful. Again, you, you don't, you don't, sometimes I don't think that you realize the impact that the gift of the life that God has given to you has. I, 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 I wish the Lord would give you a vision of that, of, of the simple gift of life that He's given to you and what you can do with your life. And you say, well, Chuck, it's on the long past part of that. I don't care. What's wrong with today? What's wrong with right now? What's wrong with changing right now and beginning to live in? That form of life when you simply say, I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you might not be able to do something like that. It's okay. What can you do? Don't tell me. Look, the disciples were like that, right? They were always trying to find out how it couldn't happen. <laughs> A lot of people are like that. There's 5,000 people here, Lord. Oh, you can't, not, it, you it, can't it, feed them. Yours one of the wages wouldn't give everybody a bite. What are we going to do? And Jesus already knew what he was going to do. He already knew what he was going to do. And he, already, he didn't even say anything. And somebody, I think it was Andrew, Andrew says, Here, Lord, we got this boy. He's got, he's got a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. And there's other disciples, yeah, but how far can that go? How far can that go amongst all these? And the Lord takes it. And he gives thanks for it. And he breaks it. I, can you imagine what it's like to be one of the disciples with your basket and every time you're pulling out something more and you don't understand how it's happening with it. And the scripture says that everyone ate to their fill. And then Jesus commands to don't let, don't, don't what? Don't lose any of it. Pick up all, pick up all the rest. Don't let any of it go to waste. Don't let any of it go to waste. I would that we would participate in a miracle like that. Why is that, Chuck? Because if you had been here this morning, that's not a slam. If you had been here this morning, what were we learning about? Well, you know what happened? All those people ate of that, and Jesus sent his disciples across in a boat, across the lake to go to the next region, and he didn't go with them. And he comes out walking on the water. And as soon as he steps in the boat, because they've been rowing, I wouldn't like to row a boat for four miles. <laughs> I, I, look, I'm just telling you right now, I just want to hook it and never root up to it. Be done, man. That's just, man. But I'm just telling you, I don't know what it's like to row. But they had been rowing for almost three or four miles, that's what it said. And they were afraid because Jesus comes up. And as soon as he steps in the boat, they get to shore. Miracle? It doesn't say how far they were, but as soon as he stepped in the boat, they were at shore. And then, all the people who ate, listen, all the people who ate of the loaves, they went looking for the Lord. They went looking for him. And you know what it says? That they realized that he hadn't gotten the boat. And, so, and then we, they go up to him and they say, Lord, when did you get here? He goes, you're not looking for me because you saw some kind of sign. He says, you're looking for me because you ate of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes. Rather, work for food that endures for eternal life. Work for that kind of food. What kind of food is that? Food of heaven. The food of heaven. The food of heaven itself. That's what that is. It endures. Our, that, that means that the food that you eat never perishes. And oh, by the way, it imparts life and it gives life. So that others might what? Live for how long? It just makes too much sense. Any thoughts in the scripture? And on the lighter side, you know that Jim has a special gift this morning? What's that? He's the handing out person of tissues. <laughs> We're going to come up with a new title on church called the Tissue Ed. You see a need. You see a need. In that little book that I read, in that little book I read, the first thing that Brother Lawrence did, you know what he did? He gave himself over to the Lord. There's no other place to start in your life. You just give yourself over wholly to God. Just give yourself to Him. All of you. 
Amen? Amen. And then just learn to love it. Learn to love it.